All right, so now that we've taken a closer look at poverty in the United States and who poor people in the United States actually are in terms of their representation and debunking some myths about being poor, let's start applying some sociological theories to explain why poverty exists and why poverty is such a difficult social problem to address. So we're gonna apply the big three here, functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. And while we apply these three theories, I'd like you to really keep in mind that theories are just kind of these frameworks that we use in sociology theology to explain and predict patterns of human behavior. And as you'll see here, these three big theories are going to explain poverty in very different ways. So you're likely going to agree with some theories more than you agree with others. And that's totally acceptable here, right? Uh, it's important to approach these theories with an open mindset. I'll let you know, I really don't like functionalism as a sociological theory. I think it's very dated and I don't think it's a very helpful tool in many discussions pertaining to social problems to really advocate for social change. Remember that was one of the big criticisms uh, that sociologists often have of functionalism is that it doesn't do a good job of explaining social change. And so in terms of generating solutions for social problems, I don't find functionalism particularly helpful. Um, but I'm still going to cover it here because it's important to have different perspectives and to understand how different um, different sociological frameworks have been used uh, to help further science in this field. So functionalist theory, just a quick recap here, assumes that society structures exist because they help society function and maintain stability, right? Remember that image of kind of like the cogs, the inner workings of a watch or of a machine is a good symbol for functionalism. When every cog or every part of society is doing what's expected of them, fulfilling their functions, society is able to operate smoothly. So in turn, functionalism argues that stratification, right? So social class inequality exists because it is functional functional and inevitable for society. So essentially, functionalists would argue that poverty, even though it's something that negatively impacts a number of people, for society as a whole, poverty is not only beneficial for society, it's inevitable, all right? So this, as you can see, gets a little problematic because a functionalist perspective says that we kind of need poor people in society in order for society as a whole to be able to function, all right? That's why I'm not so down with the functionalism. I don't really buy this argument. I think it's pretty weak, and we'll talk a little bit more about why in the coming slides here. So according to a functionalist perspective, in any society, some jobs are considered more important and therefore require more skill or knowledge than others. So for example, things like being a surgeon or the executive of a company or a lawyer, often jobs that would require you to have, you know, advanced schooling, right, which typically uh, requires more time, often requires more money, and for those reasons alone become accessible to a smaller and smaller portion of the general population. So since quote unquote important jobs are more difficult to attain, society should encourage individuals to pursue those important jobs by promising them higher incomes or other rewards. So a functionalist is going to say, you know, if we would pay a doctor the same amount of money that we pay a janitor, why would anyone want to go to school for another 10 years and take out, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of student loans if they can make just as much money getting a job without, uh, with not even having a high school degree? So a functionalist says, you know, it's functional to pay different jobs different amounts of money because it kind of offers this incentive for people to go through the extra time and work that it takes to get the training and the skill set required for these more prestigious jobs in society. So as a result, structural functionalism suggests that stratification becomes inevitable and functional for a society because it kind of produces this distribution of resources that allows us to allocate people into different positions and different jobs, all of which are necessary for society, right? Just as much as we need, you know, surgeons and lawyers in society, we also need people you know, working at fast food restaurants and people working as custodians because without those individuals, you know, society as a whole would be at a deficit. So according to functionalism, if stratification is inevitable, poverty also as a result becomes inevitable. If poor people are poor, it's because they lack the ability to gain the skills and knowledge necessary for higher paying jobs. 
And while this may be a disadvantage for some people, it actually presents advantages for other people in society. So again, functionalism, looking at this from a broader perspective, right, this macro level perspective, they're taking a look at how society as a whole is impacted by poverty. And the, fun the argument a functionalist is going to make is that while poverty is going to be disadvantaging uh, for certain groups of people, for society as a whole, it's beneficial because this competition kind of over who gets which jobs, how we label certain jobs as being more prestigious as others, incentivizes individuals to pursue those jobs that we need. We need lawyers, we need doctors, we need you know executives in order for society as a whole to function. Poverty is also functional for society, according to functionalism. Uh, this perspective suggests that poor people do the work that rich people don't want to. Programs and services that help the poor provide jobs for others. So, for example, uh, since we have a poverty line, you know, we need social workers in our society to calculate how and when people are crossing over the, the poverty line. So it creates jobs in that regard uh, for individuals. So that's some way that poverty is functional. Poor people also help the economy by purchasing goods like day old bread and used clothing uh, that otherwise would go to waste. You know, uh, so they're kind of stimulating the economy by purchasing these goods and services that maybe richer people in society wouldn't want to purchase. So that's a functional thing. Uh, according to this argument, middle and upper classes have a vested interest in, in neglecting poverty to help ensure its continued existence. Again, this is why I'm not a super big fan of functionalism here. It doesn't really do anything for us in terms of offering suggestions about how we as a society could change to actually reduce poverty. Rather than accepting poverty as something that merely exists and, is, and provides some sort of functions, enables us to get by, I don't buy it. Simply based off of all of the data and statistics we covered in earlier presentations that suggest that poverty overall is not a good thing for society as a whole because it costs all of us a lot of money and it doesn't do any good for our economy to have this gross disparity of being people being super rich and people being super poor. We really would benefit more from leveling out the distribution of wealth in our society. So for these reasons, I'm not big on functionalism, but I produce introduce it to you here anyway. So problems with functionalism, who decides what jobs are important and deserving of more money, you know, who decides in our society that, you know, a player in the NFL or the NBA should be getting paid tens of millions of dollars a year uh, when a full-time elementary school teacher could get paid as little as $25,000 a year? You know, who really decides what jobs are worth what and how do we distribute wealth in our society? You know, that really is illogical. Does it make any sense that we pay athletes and celebrities and, you know, CEOs and executives of companies, you know, millions if not billions of dollars a year when we have millions of people that can barely afford to put food on their tables you know in what way is that level of income inequality functional for our society that's a really big criticism of functionalism here um, another problem with functionalism is that imp it implies that people can improve their economic status by improving their skills or knowledge. So if you want to make more money, you could just go to school longer to get a higher paying job, right? Of course, this disregards society's lack of equal opportunity, uh, which we'll definitely talk more about in the, um, in the section on education here. It's not so easy to just go to school to get a college degree if you're facing these structural barriers that prevent you from having equal access and equal opportunity in education, right? So social class mobility, being able to move up in social class, while it does sound good in theory, it is not equally accessible to everyone. So conflict theory, I think a lot more helpful in terms of addressing uh, poverty as a social problem. Conflict theorists suggest that stratification results from lack of opportunity and from discrimination and prejudice against poor women and people of color. So again, the statistics that we looked at strongly suggested that being a woman, uh, being a person of color, significantly impact the likelihood that you'll live in poverty. So it is neither necessary nor inevitable to have poverty in our society. Rather, it's something that we as a society have produced. And it's also something that we can change. People with power, according to conflict theory, take advantage of their position at the top of society to stay at the top, 
even if it means oppressing those at the bottom. So again, remember, conflict theory is always going to argue that uh, people in society compete over scarce resources, and whoever has more of those resources has more power in society. And so they're likely to build social structures in our society that make it very, uh, very likely for them to maintain their power and also make it far more difficult for people without power to ever achieve any sort of upward social mobility. Confa theory recognizes that there are often structural barriers that prevent individuals from achieving upward social mobility. It's hard to get a job and quote unquote, pull yourself up by the bootstraps if you are homeless and are living in poverty since most jobs require you to have things like a residence, a phone, reliable transportation, etc. before they'll even hire you, right? So it's hard to get a better job if you can't afford to go to college, if you have children or other dependents at home, etc. There's so many structural factors that affect any one individual's ability to get a better education, to get a better job beyond just individual's drive or willpower to succeed in life. So lastly, symbolic interactionism and poverty, unlike the functionalist and conflict view, symbolic interactionism doesn't really try to explain why we have stratification in the first place. Rather, symbolic interactionism examines the differences that stratification makes for people's lifestyles and their interaction with other people. So symbolic interactionism really recognizes that the labeling of a certain group as poor really affects how other members of society view and interact with them. So symbolic interactionism, remember, is really about labeling and meaning making in society. So instead of really trying to understand uh, kind of a, this larger structural effects of poverty in our society, symbolic interactionism is more interested in how labeling certain people as poor versus rich, as labeling certain people as homeless, uh, really affects the way that they're treated and viewed in society, right? So they're interested in how we socially construct this idea about what it means to be poor in the United States. Symbolic interactionists are really interested in understanding how we came to label poor people as lazy in the United States. How did this social construct of the American dream, the idea that anybody can work hard enough and pull, them up pull themselves up by the bootstraps, how did that idea become a belief that got firmly cemented in our society? Who constructed that idea? How has it withstood um, several decades in different generations? And why do we still hold on so tightly to that belief and value? And as a symbolic interactionist would argue, the way we label poor people in the United States has really significant effects on the way we treat poor people. And that's why it's important for us from a sociological perspective to understand the meaning behind the words and the labels and the ideas that we construct around poor people. Symbolic interactionists would argue that if we change the narrative that we have in the United States around being poor, if we started talking about poor people in a more favorable light, instead of just automatically stigmatizing them and labeling them as lazy, we could potentially reduce poverty and create more or greater uh, income equality throughout the United States.